develop interventions that improve quality of care and health outcomes, especially for persons with neurological conditions. We will have time at the end for some questions. Uh, you can put them in the chat or um, raise your hand. We, one thing I want to mention, we do have a new website. So if you guys get a chance, go on to smartnetworkcenter.ca and check it out. Laura's done a fantastic job. Same information, just it, it looks really, really sharp. So I'm super excited to announce our speakers today. We have Adam Ostashek. He's a mechanical engineering master's student in Dr. Dan Samiotto's Dan Samioto, polymer microfabrication lab. He's the CEO of Zipperprint and a foundry metallurgist of Norwood Foundry. He has a Bachelor of Science in Materials Engineering with a specialization in nano and functional materials. His background in materials engineering has provided him with a unique viewpoint regarding material selection and how multiple materials can come together to make something new and exciting. He's also an avid musician, outdoorsman, and enjoys spending time gardening with his partner, cat and dog. Our second speaker is Carly O'Sullivan. She's a second year neuroscience master's student in Dr. Vivian Mushwar's lab. She has a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology from the University of Alberta in 2018. And her background in rehabilitation settings has really influenced her desire to improve treatment outcomes. And this was a large influence on getting involved with the Mushwar lab. She enjoys hiking and climbing in the mountains and getting out into the river valley. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the speakers. I'm not sure which one of you is gonna go first. Carly. Uh, yeah, sorry, Laura, or sorry, Michelle, it's me. No worries. Okay, <clears throat> so I believe my screen should be sharing all right. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my thesis research today. So the overall goal of this project is to understand the mechanisms and functional outcomes of two types of electrical stimulation. Uh, these two types are epidural stimulation and intraspinal microstimulation. My project focuses on a component of this larger goal, and that's to determine the type and distribution of neurons that are activated during epidural stimulation and intraspinal microstimulation. Sorry, here we go. So the motivation for my work is to investigate effective therapies for individuals experiencing spinal cord injury, which as we know is a devastating, uh, is a, sorry, an injury to the spinal cord that has devastating effects to an individual's function and quality of life. The WHO estimates that between 250,000 to 300,000 people are affected by spinal cord injuries every year. There are many secondary complications that come from spinal cord injury, and this includes things like autonomic dysreflexia, uh, musculoskeletal issues, cardiovascular and respiratory issues, pressure injuries, spasticity, pain, uh, and many others. Despite all of these complications, mobility is one of the major functions lost after spinal cord injury, which is why this work will focus on restoring um, <clears throat> standing and walking following spinal cord injury, because this could help alleviate some of these other secondary complications. My focus is on using spinal cord stimulation to restore standing and walking following spinal cord injury, which is um, a use that has been proposed by many others as well. It's also an area that individuals of, with the spinal cord injury have addressed as a function they'd like to regain. There's um, this is, sorry, so we're going to be using electrical stimulation to activate the motor networks uh, that reside in the spinal cord as a way to restore standing and walking. There are a couple promising methods of spinal cord stimulation that I'm going to be um, discussing, and this includes epidural spinal cord stimulation, uh, which was initially used to cure intractable pain, and intraspinal microstimulation, which was initially used to restore bladder function in humans. Um, it's worth noting that there's also another type of spinal cord stimulation called transcutaneous spinal cord stimulation. However, this is not something I'm going to be discussing, but it's worth noting that it is much less invasive than these other two methods. So to start, um, epidural spinal cord stimulation uh, involves an array that sits on the dura of the spinal cord, as can be seen here in this image. Stimulation targets the dorsal surface uh, of the spinal cord more directly, which is noted in red, and the locomotor regions indirectly, which are denoted in blue. There's been some success so far in terms of walking with epidural stimulation. In 2018, Angela et al. were able to get um, an individual with a motor complete spinal cord injury to walk 91 meters uh, without a rest. As noted earlier, epidural spinal cord stimulation has been used in humans. There's a really popular example of epidural spinal cord stimulation in the media, and this involves um, a member of the Humboldt Broncos uh, hockey team that was involved in that bus crash a few years ago. 
Uh, this player traveled to Thailand to have the epidural stimulator array implanted in their spinal cord and to date has been able to achieve some stepping uh, while requiring quite a bit of weight support. So the other type of spinal cord stimulation method that I'm going to discuss is intraspinal microstimulation. This involves play, um, inserting very fine microwires into the ventral horn of the spinal cord, as indicated here in this image. Um, the stimulation more directly targets the locomotor regions, as indicated here by the red, um, than it then is directly targeted, sorry, than in epidural stimulation. Um, a study by Talinsky et al. in 2016 um, was able to achieve 835 meters of cumulative walking in cats. Um, this did involve some rest, but it, so it was cumulative over the experiment. There was also a chronic study done in 2011 by Mushuar et al. with cats, and they demonstrated the feasibility of ISMS arrays to be implanted in the body for long periods of time, as well as for the um, movements evoked to be stable over time. This has not yet been used in humans for the purpose of restoring locomotion. However, as noted earlier, it has been used in humans for the purpose of restoring bladder function. All right, so despite the current knowledge on spinal cord stimulation, there are still many unknowns, as well as obvious differences between the two types of stimulation methods. This project aims to add knowledge to the field and understanding by achieving these three aims. Uh, this includes identifying the location and pattern of activation in the lumbosacral spinal cord produced by epidural spinal cord stimulation and intraspinal microstimulation. Um, involve, or sorry, evaluating the long-term effectiveness of epidural stimulation and intraspinal microstimulation with and without locomotion training. And finally, to investigate the neural reorganization that occurs with these two types of stimulation modalities. My project is uh, going to be focusing on the first aim here, and we are doing this to understand the individual, how the individual stimulations uh, work and the pathways by which they act. So based on this aim for my project, we are hypothesizing that most of the activity by epidural stimulation will reside in the dorsal horn with scattered activation into the ventral horn, while with ISMS, we expect that the most of the activity is going to be in the intermediate and ventral regions of the spinal cord. We also hypothesize that there will be a mix of excitatory and inhibitory neurons activated by the two spinal cord stimulation modalities. So one of the first things that we needed to do was determine the duration of stimulation. The length of the stimulation needed to be long enough for uh, there to be um, enough activity that we could study the differences between the two stimulation methods. So to do this, we looked at a few different stimulation conditions. So for epidural stimulation, we stimulated for one hour and we also stimulated for five hours. This would have been done in different animals. We did the same thing for ISMS where we stimulated one animal for an hour and one animal for five hours. Each animal would have had an alaminectomy, uh, then they would have undergone the stimulation then following stimulation, the animal would have been euthanized and the tissue would have been blocked, um, or sorry, the spinal cord would have been blocked and the, removed. The spinal cord would have then been blocked and uh, immunohistochemical analysis was completed. So before going to the results, I just need to quickly explain how we look for neuron activation and that's by looking at CFOS. So this is a member of the FOS family of proteins. It's a proto-oncogene and it alters gene transcription by um, interacting with DNA. CFOS is expressed in the nucleus when the cell has been active. So positive staining um, for CFOS indicates that there was neural activity. So moving into the results now, um, when we're looking here, this is the one hour stimulation condition of epidural spinal cord stimulation. When we look at the uh, sham side of the spinal cord where no stimulation was done, and we compare it with the uh, stimulation side, which was stimulated in this case for one hour, we see that there is very little visible difference um, between the two conditions. So it's important here to note that no statistics were actually run. Looking at the five hour stimulation condition now, we see that in the stimulation side, after five hours of stimulation, the, the density of CFOS is quite high in the dorsal horn um, and is not quite as dense in the uh, sham side of the spinal cord. Um, it's worth noting, however, that because epidural spinal cord stimulation sits on the dura of the spinal cord, um, the stimulation is not quite as localized, and that's likely why we don't see as much of a difference as you'd maybe expect between the stimulation side and the sham side. Uh, in the case of ISMS, we see similar results. So after one hour of stimulation, we see that in the ventral horn here, uh, in the sham side compared with the stimulation side, there's very little difference in the amount of CFOS expressed. And once again, this is a visual difference, and no statistics were run. Similarly, in the five or in the five hour condition, we see that in the ventral horn and the sham side, there's much less CFOS expressed than in the ventral horn of the stimulation side. Um, 
The images on the side of the slide here in the five hour stimulation condition are images taken from the location demonstrated on the spinal cord cross sections. Um, the black dots in the image represent one neuron that's been activated with CFOS, or that's been stained, meaning that for CFOS, meaning that it's been activated. And you can see that there's a visual difference between the amount of CFOS expressed in the sham side in comparison with the stimulation side. So all of this is to say that we found that uh, five hours of stimulation was better. Uh, she gave us better CFOS expression, and so this is the length of stimulation that we decided to use going forward. So moving on into how we um, studied the, the, did the, how we tested out these hypotheses. We used 24, 45 to 55 kilogram female domestic pigs. Six pigs were used in an epidural stimulation condition where we uh, implanted an epidural stimulator and stimulated for five hours. Three were involved in an epidural sham. So this involved inserting the epidural stimulator but not giving any form of stimulation. Uh, we did six with ISMS stimulation, which again involved inserting the array. Um, and then three and stimulating for five hours and then three pigs that were had the array inserted but there was no stimulation. We also did three laminectomy controls which is where the animal um, was given a laminectomy but there was no uh, device inserted and no stimulation given and finally we did three naive controls and in this case um, the animal is just uh, put under anesthesia and left on the table for five hours and then the rest of the procedure is continued but there's no uh, laminectomy or stimulation or device implanted. So for all of the pigs in every condition, except for the naive um, sham, the, uh, the pigs were given a laminectomy. This laminectomy was L4 to L5 in the case of epidural stimulation or L3 to L5 in the case of intraspinal microstimulation. The device is placed on both sides of the animal and both sides of the spinal cord, but only one side of the cord is stimulated for five hours and the other side is uh, the sham side. Um, during the five hours of stimulation, the stimulation is set at a threshold where we can see just barely visible contraction. We are stimulating at 40 hertz, and the cycle is two seconds uh, of stimulation followed by two seconds of rest. The spinal, or following stimulation, the animal is perfused with 10% formalin, and the spinal cord is removed and blocked uh, to be analyzed for immune histochemical analysis. So up here on the top is an example of the epidural stimulation array that we are using. There are many different types of epidural stimulators, uh, but this is the one that we chose to use for our specific project. And here is an example of the ISMS device. Um, so here between the, um, the two caudal and two rostral electrodes, the spacing is four millimeters. And in between the two sets of electrodes, the spacing is either 15 to 20 millimeters, depending on the size of the animal. In the case of um, intraspinal microstimulation, the wires are 50 microns, which is about the size of a strand of human hair. Um, and then to insert the electrodes, we free them from this tube and we insert them one at a time into the spinal cord. So for the staining that we have to do, we will section the spinal cord in 20 micron cryo sections, which will allow us to identify the distribution and the type of active neurons. So we'll do this by staining. And the first group that we're gonna look at looks at the distribution of neurons. So we're gonna stain for uh, CFOS, which as mentioned earlier, is a marker of neural activity. That's what we're using it for. We're gonna be staining for new N, which labels the nuclei of all neurons. And we will also be staining with DAPI, which labels the nuclei of all cells. Um, so then we're also gonna be staining for neuron type. And three of these stains are calcium binding protein, and this includes calbindin, calretinin, and parvalbumin. Calretin is a, an stains for excitatory interneurons. Calbindin also stains for excitatory interneurons. These two seem to have some overlap, um, and this seems to be the difference seems to be related to where they lie in the spinal cord. Um, and they both stain for glutamatergic interneurons, which are uh, excitatory interneurons. Parvalbumin uh, stains for inhibitory interneurons and it stains GABAergic and glycinergic interneurons, which again are inhibitory interneurons. We're also staining for CHAT, which is choline acetyl transferase. This stains cholinergic neurons, which includes the alpha motor neurons. And finally, we're staining for GAD67, which is glutamate decarboxylase, which also uh, stains inhibitory interneurons. So the slides are gonna be triple labeled. Uh, each slide will be labeled with CFOS, new N, and then one of the stains for the, the type of neuron. As well, each slide will also be stained with DAPI. 
So, so far we've done 12 of the 24 experiments. Four of these have been epidural stimulation, three have been ISMS, two have been an ISMS sham, two have been laminectomy controls, and most recently one has been a naive control. Uh, the staining protocols are being worked on with Dr. Howland and James Kraut from the University of Louisville. So we're just going to look at these slides again quickly, and this time we're looking at the difference between the epidural stimulation and the intraspinal microstimulation. So here we can see in the epidural stimulation um, condition, and this is compared with the ISMS stimulation side, the density of CFOS in the ISMS condition is much greater in the ventral horn than it is in the ISMS, or sorry, in the epidural stimulation ventral horn. Uh, when we look at the density in the uh, much greater in uh, epidural stimulation as opposed to in intraspinal microstimulation. And this supports what we were expecting to see based on the hypothesis. Uh, so here now we're going to look at an example of some preliminary staining, fluorescent staining from our lab. What I've circled here in this image here is a cell that has been triple labeled. So we'll go through and when we see here you can see that um, the cell very faintly in blue here has been labeled with DAPI. And as a reminder, DAPI stains the nuclei of all cells. Uh, we can see that the same cell has also been stained with new N. And again, as a reminder, new N stains the neurons, uh, or sorry, the nuclei of neurons. And then it has also been stained for CFOS. And because CFOS is a marker of neural activity, we know that this was a neuron that was recently active. So using this technique, along with the initial stains we discussed, such as those for neuron type, uh, we'll be able to see if a neuron is active and what type of neuron it is. Depending on the experimental group that the animal is a part of, we will get a better idea of the activation patterns and the types of neurons that are activated. Okay, so we also wanted to uh, make sure that, because we've already done a few pigs, we wanted to make sure that the uh, location we are stimulating was correct. So as you can see in this image here, this is what we're looking at in the spinal cord. This is the dorsal horn here, and this is the ventral horn. Um, where we wanted to see the electrode was here in the ventral horn. Unfortunately, what we see is that we've missed the ventral horn, and this is the electrode tract here. Um, this image is an example of H&E staining, which is hematoxylin and eosin staining. And we use this as um, to show the general layout of the tissue. So uh, this is half a millimeter caudal in the spinal cord. And what we see here is we see two electrode tracts. Again, unfortunately, not in the ventral horn. The reason for seeing two is what we, um, we use what we call a fishing electrode when we're trying to find make sure that we're in the right location of the spinal cord. So that's a, a free electrode that we place in and we stimulate. And based on the reaction, we can tell if we're where we want to be. Um, so this could be an example of a tract from a fishing electrode, or it could also be that we implanted the electrode, realized it wasn't in the right position and re, uh, reinserted it and adjusted the position. Although we did miss the ventral horn, what we know about ISMS is that the stimulation diameter spreads about um, 500 microns or half a millimeter from the electrode insertion. So when we look here, the scale bar is 500 microns, and we see that likely, although we weren't in the ventral horn, it's likely that we were activating some of the neurons that are in here. Um, and, uh, and so while going forward, we likely will use ultrasound to help guide our placement it's likely that we were still seeing activation of what we wanted to see because the results we saw were similar to what we'd like to see. All right, so what's next? Uh, so we have 12 additional experiments. Um, we've started cryosectioning, but we need to continue. There's gonna be quite a lot of that to do. And we also still need to um, stain the tissue as well as then analyze the data. So there's still quite a bit to be done, but it's moving along nicely. So for the first time, uh, the sites of activation of epidural stimulation and intraspinal microstimulation will be examined and compared. Uh, a really interesting thing about this project is that we'll have an understanding of how the mode of stimulation in an intact animal works, which allows us for next steps to be pursued. Um, so this is very much like a, the first step in, in this work. Uh, and then of course, the findings that we find will add to existing knowledge on neuromodulation. I'd like to thank um, the following people for all their help. It's been uh, ex incredibly appreciated, as well as the funders for their financial support. And with that, I'll hand it off to Adam. Hey, right. thanks Carly for the presentation. So.
All right, can you see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So my name is Adam Ostershek. I am a master's student in Dr. Dan Samioto's lab, and I will be presenting my talk today on additively manufactured stretchable electrical devices. So just a, so just a, an agenda to kind of uh, give us a roadmap to, for the talk. So I'll start with an introduction to FDM 3D printing for those who are a little bit less familiar with it. Then I'll discuss what stretchable electronics are and get more into the, the reasoning why we would want to use stretchable electronics versus conventional electronics. Then I'll discuss the materials. Uh, it's a core shell structure, so we need two different kinds of materials um, that can work together with each other, as well as require some other mechanical properties. Um, then I'll discuss the development of our 3D printer upgrades that we've been working on over several years. And I'll show the progress that we've made so far. And I'll discuss the future directions that we need to go in. So a quick introduction to FDM 3D printing. Um, FDM stands for Fused Deposition Modeling, which refers to uh, the method that it prints out these, uh, these parts. So what it does is it's an additive manufacturing method where um, material is built up from the bottom compared to a subtractive method, such as like machining or something like that, or sculpting, where you get a big block and chop it away until you have your final part. So what this does is it takes this filament up here, uh, pushes it through a heated die, and then it squirts it down onto a substrate on the bottom. Um, while moving in X and Y directions in a prescribed uh, code. Um, and so it does this and it'll print slices of the part in uh, two dimensions and then go up in the Z direction a little bit and continue printing that until you have the final part. So stretchable electronics are, it's kind of a, a wide, wide range of things. Um, but generally, it's a device or a component that can operate under dynamic mechanical forces. Uh, it's extensible in at least one direction. It's flexible, reversibly flexible, and they contain compliant con uh, conductors. And so since these exist, why, why would we want, bother wanting to use these? Um, so if you think of um, something that needs to be able to stretch, currently the, the solution when using conventional electronics is you would add extra uh, conductor length. So you'd have like a coil of wire or something like that to account for that extra stretch. So using stretchable electronics uh, uses less material in this case um, as well. In the case of liquid metals, electromigration is completely eliminated because um, in a liquid, you can have your electrons flow freely within it. Um, and as well, for stretchability and flexibility, uh, it allows the shape to change of your device. So in terms of a wire, that might not be super useful. But in terms of like a planar reflector of some, or something like that, that could be very useful. So. In this work, as I mentioned before, uh, these devices are made of a shell and a core. And so the shell, we looked into two different kinds of uh, polymers. We looked into thermoplastics and thermosets. We ultimately went with thermoplastics due to the ease of printing with a 3D printer, um, recyclability, biocompatibility properties, and just general ease of use. Um, so we also looked into thermoset rubbers, generally PDMS and different grades of PDMS. And then for the core structures, there's quite a few options available. Um, we looked into metal particles, such as silver pastes and serpentine metal structures. And then we also looked into metal, liquid metals, sorry, um, such as mercury, which was quickly 
dash to the side, uh, gallium and its alloys, and ionic liquids. We didn't end up going with ionic liquids, but it's important to note that they are uh, an option for conductivity, but they're not quite as easy to work with in our case. So for the thermoplastic that we went with, we went with uh, a styrenic copolymer. Uh, it's called SCBS. And so it has polystyrene uh, ends to it. And then in, in the center of it, it's got an ethylene butylene um, copolymer. So that gives it its extra stretch. The, the polystyrene on the ends gives it its strength and its hardness. So as a thermoplastic, it's got a whole bunch of different methods to, to manufacture. So if you essentially kind of dissolve it in uh, uh, a solvent, you can cast it into whatever shape that you need. Uh, it's, it's extrudable, as I'll discuss more with our 3D printer. Uh, it's recyclable as a thermoplastic. You can remelt it and reproduce it into new materials or new parts, sorry. Um, the one that we chose is biocompatible, and it also has a low shore hardness and a high elongation until failure. I'm sorry, Adam. I do know I no longer see your presentation. Does anyone else? Has anyone else lost it? Yeah, it's the same thing. Oh, uh -oh. yeah. Maybe just reshare. Okay. Is this better? Yep, it's back. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Oh, no worries. Um, so I'm not too sure how much of the slide that you saw, but just to reiterate, uh, we chose uh, an SCBS polymer, which is styrene and ethylene betaline with another styrene end on it. Um, these can be dissolved, which makes them castable. Um, you can extrude them, which I'll discuss with the 3D printer. They can re be recycled as thermoplastics. Um, the material that we chose is biocompatible with a low shore hardness and a high elongation. So those were desirable properties for this. Um, another material that we looked into was PDMS. We looked at different strengths, different shore hardnesses, um, but we were typically stuck to uh, two-part PDMSs, which is um, for those who don't know, uh, PDMS is silicone, silicone rubber. So we would use a two-part castable silicone rubber in a mold to create parts and then uh, afterwards fill that with a liquid metal using a syringe or a uh, or high pressures, which was, we found it quite difficult, um, but it is possible. PDMS is also often biocompatible and chemically inert once it's cured. But one of the downsides to it is that it has a low tear strength. And for core materials, we looked into several, several different options. Uh, one of them was a silver paste, which is a suspension of silver particles in a polymer binder and solvents. And one of the issues to it is that it has a relatively low conductivity until it's sintered. So what you would do is you would paint it on something, sinter it, and this causes your silver particles to remelt and create a continuous silver structure. But in that case, that creates an issue because once you create your continuous silver structure, uh, you start getting mechanical properties of your silver and then it doesn't become a compliant uh, structure anymore. And the other issue is that the non-metallic components in it don't have any guarantees to be biocompatible or safe to really use around skin. Another option we looked into were serpentine metal structures. Uh, the image isn't of a, a metal structure, but uh, it kind of gives you the, the idea of what it would look like. So these would be micro or even nano, yeah, nanoscale uh, parts coiled into kind of a mesh or some array of these serpentine structures. 
And once a tensile stress is applied to them, they elongate by straightening out. Uh, depending on how they're configured, they can rotate in plane or out of plane and buckle in different directions as well. Uh, briefly, mercury was looked at, but it was not really looked at too in depth uh, due to its high toxicity and its high density, which would make it um, quite heavy in our devices and also not really useful in kind of biocompatible uh, situations. But it also has a high conductivity, quite a low viscosity, and it's a liquid at room temperature, which were desirable uh, properties for us. So we looked into other materials that were that had these similar properties without the toxicity and the density. So what we ended up choosing was a family of gallium alloys. So gallium is a transition metal, which is liquid just around 32 degrees Celsius. So that we found that pretty promising. And once you add some other metals to it, it becomes liquid at room temperature. So by adding indium in around three parts gallium to one part indium, uh, you get something called E gain, which the E is eutectic, gallium indium. So this has a melting point of around 15. Oh, did my screen disappear again? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure why it's doing that. Uh, but anyway, so uh, these gallium indium tin alloys, um, with gallium indium, it becomes liquid at around 15 degrees Celsius. And then with galanstan, which is gallium indium, indium and tin, uh, approximately 10% tin added to that, um, gives a melting point of around negative 15 degrees Celsius. So we were quite interested in these. Um, they're also non-toxic. They have a relatively high con conductivity. It's about 1 16th that of uh, copper. So it's still pretty high. Um, it has a low viscosity, which makes it easily flowable. And it also has interesting properties because it has a very rapid surface oxide growth, which gives it a little bit of a bit of a skin tensile strength, I guess you could say. Um, so you could, we can essentially 3D print uh, self-standing droplets with, because of this. That wasn't what we were quite looking for, but it did help. So just to reiterate, the materials that we chose, uh, the shell we chose a thermoplastic styrenic copolymer called Craton G1657. And then for the core, we tried both E-gain and gallon stand. So before I get into the development of the 3D printer upgrades, this image here is kind of to give you an idea as to the, the scale of the device that we're working with and the kind of what the, the gallium looks like coming out of the extruding system. So, oh. So this device here is called our tri-extruder manifold. Um, it's got three inputs and one single output. What you can see here on the right is our inlet from a uh, polymer extruder, a pellet extruder system, which lets us, which lets, sorry, which lets us use um, a wide variety of uh, pelletized polymers. On the left side is a is a traditional kind of filament style uh, 3D printer extruder inlet. And then at the very top is our coaxial inlet where we can put our liquid metal or whatever kind of uh, fluids we want coaxially. And then at the very bottom, you can see the output where we've got 
that's SCBS going through there. And currently, yeah. Yeah, I believe that was just air in this image here. Um, oh, okay, I'm not sure that's gonna work. So this video here shows how we, uh, it shows both how the 3D printer works in the Z direction kind of thing and also how we, how our devices come out. So what you're seeing here is the, the core shell structure uh, with the SCBS being that kind of lighter gray. And then the darker part that you see, uh, it might be hard to see the wire on the inside, but there, there is a wire on the inside, a liquid metal wire. And so blowing it out a little bit so you can kind of get a, a, an idea of the entire system. Um, our system is made up of four main components. So we've got the pellet extruder, as I discussed before. We have a, a hopper at the top here where you can feed in your pellets. And then it goes through a, uh, a screw, a heated screw, and then into our heated hose where it uh, conveys into the tri extruder manifold. As well on the top left, there's the syringe pump, which we've since uh, replaced with a, a stepper motor controlled through the 3D printer uh, controller system for ease of programming and um, combining the two flow rates together. Lost you again, Adam. All right. All right. So yes, the syringe pump has been replaced with um, a stepper motor attached to the 3D printer for ease of uh, programming. And then they all reach into the tri extruder, which combines them to produce our output. And then here's a cross section of the, the manifold. So to date, we've produced uh, several wires uh, and several devices as well. Uh, the conductive wires that we've produced have been able to work uninterrupted up to 400% elongation. Um, and we've cycled them over a thousand times and they've worked without any, any losses in their uh, conductivity. Um, what you can see in the image here, uh, C and D are different uh, different diameters of wires based on the drawing speed. We were able to adjust our the feed speed of the coaxial uh, liquid metal and the polymer as well. And that determines the diameter of your internal wire and the external wire. So on the left, the top left, you can see that it was a little bit slower of a speed. And then on the top right, you can see that it was a little bit faster of a speed and slower speed for the liquid metal extrusion. What we're also able to do, oh, that's, um, what we were also able to do was, uh, heat these up a little bit further and then thermally draw them out to decrease their diameter even further. So what you can see in G and H are the initial uh, wire in G and then in H that's after we heated it up and drew it out a little bit. So in H we've got a, uh, a diameter of 190 microns for the core. But we're able to go even further than that. So this image here that you see, uh, you can see a 50 micron wire with a 25 micron liquid metal core inside that we drew using thermal, thermal drawing. Um, 
and then the, the wire kind of balloons back up to its initial uh, size, which was a two millimeter wire with a 670 micron core. Um, we connected those parts directly one side to an LED uh, just by sticking one of the leads into the wire and then the other one to a male pin jumper cable just by sticking that lead into the wire as well. And this was able to run for 24 hours without any, any uh, distinctive loss of uh, illumination that we could notice. We're also able to produce a couple sensors. Uh, the one on the left is a pressure sensor that we were able to um, determine a pressure based on the change in resistance. And the device on the right is an inductive uh, sensor as well. And that changes the inductance based on the, the radial stretch on it. So as you can see here, uh, with the 35 PSI applied pressure, we were able to get a 16% change in the resistance of our pressure sensor. And then in our inductor, we were able to get a, a 30, a value of 30 Henry's, sorry, 30 micro Henry's with a, a stretch of 30 uh, millimeters in diameter. So for future directions going forward, uh, we're going to improve our interfacing with our conventional wires and other components. Um, we're going to improve the thermal drawing capabilities to make it a little bit better controlled. Uh, we've also since worked on the concentricity of the wires, improved that so it's not quite off to the side as much as you were seeing previously. And then we've also, uh, we're also working on improved sensors as well and new different sensor designs. So thank you. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much, you guys. That was a great, some great presentations. Um, so guess, do we have some questions? Sorry, Michelle, we also um, wanted to discuss the similarities of our project. Fantastic. So <clears throat> in terms of similarities, we were struggling to come up and I guess, you know, there's there's an element of manufacturing in, in the case of both projects. But one thing that we really noticed is that, um, so with uh, neuromodulation, the spinal cord in an, an area that um, ISMS is lacking a little bit is that, um, the, the spinal cord does stretch with movement. Uh, and so long-term ISMS needs to um, take that into account. And that is being worked on in our lab, but with Adam's electrodes, that's there's a potential application for them there. I don't know, do you have anything to add there, Adam? Um, yeah, so yeah, in the ISMS um, electrodes, um, one of your images, Carly, showed the it's like that long, long wires. Um, so I believe you mentioned that those stretch, what, 10%? Ours don't stretch, no, sorry, ours don't stretch at all. I believe it's the spinal cord and, and the oh, right. pig stretches about 10%. Right, and so with, um, with an interface in those wires with um, some of the stretchable wires, that could provide um, some extra flex for the, the spine in that case. Okay, we'll open the floor for some questions. Um, I'll start out with the first question. So if you can, so when, when we're talking about using your technology with the ISMS electrodes, are you, like, are you looking at a stiff electrode attached to the flexible, a flexible piece so that it doesn't lose its, its strength to go, to get to the location it needs to go? How would that work? So I'll uh, share that image again. And that might help. Um, Thank you. 
Okay, so it's, it's, oops, went too far. So it's this image here that we're talking about. Um, so this piece here, this is what is actually inserted into the spinal cord and the tip uh, that's in the tube is beveled to about 15 degrees so that it can pierce through the pia mater, which is a tough outer layer. Um, so this needs to remain <clears throat> uh, as stiff uh, so that we can implant it into the spinal cord. But this part here lies along the top of the, on the, like, the surface of the spinal cord. And that's the piece that needs to be able to be flexible because the, the spine does stretch uh, in movement. And because this needs to stay in the spinal cord, we need this to be able to stretch a bit to accommodate the movement of the person. So this is kind of where we'd be looking at having um, this piece being stretchable and this piece being stiff. So here being the interface. Very interesting, thank you. Um, we do have a message in the chat here. The question is, Adam, have you checked the biocompatibility tests of a complete device? Um, no, not yet. But that is, that's something that we would be interested in looking into in the future. Michelle, can I um, uh, follow up on that? Um, on um, uh, Michel Gauthier's question. Um, yeah, so um, the, um, yeah, that, you know, this very interesting uh, technology, Adam, uh, for sure. And, and I do agree with uh, Carly that uh, this will probably have direct um, applications in interspinal microstimulation. I was very impressed to see that your wire could be down, go down to a diameter of, of um, um, 50, microns and, and the inner core is 25 microns. So that's really great. My, uh, my question is, um, what is the modulus of your wire? What is the, have you tried to look at the elasticity or the uh, modulus of elasticity of the uh, wire, especially the, the thin uh, wires? And have you looked at the mechanical fatigue? So if you were to stretch it, multiple million times. Um, do you know what the behavior would be? And whether it's in air versus sitting in kind of a biological environment perhaps or in fluid? Ah, okay. Great question. Um, we haven't looked directly into the, the modulus of the, the wires themselves. Uh, we just have uh, mechanical information for the the SCBS, but that's something that we could that we could do pretty pretty easily, I believe. Um, we've cycled the wires up to a thousand times, and we didn't find any decrease in the the resistance or the conductivity. So, yeah, I suppose a million times would be kind of the next next step for that. And we haven't tried it in. We've only cycled it in air. We haven't. Uh, cycle it in biological media or any liquid or anything like that. But that's something that we could try for sure. Yeah. Just sorry, I'm hogging time, Michelle, but what just one last thing. Are you able to are you able to make the outside core? So in other words, not the not the core, sorry, but the wire itself. So um, uh, even smaller because right now you have basically a 25 micron diameter uh, or a 25 micron thickness. Of the of your I'm gonna call it I can't remember the the material the thermoplastic that you used but are you able to make that thinner? Does um, the wall thickness have to be 25 micron or can you can you get smaller? It doesn't necessarily have to be 25 microns. Um, we are limited by uh, the density of the the metal inside and the the flow rates. Uh, if the flow rates are too off, uh, we use we calculate them using uh, a Weber number and sorry, the the name's escaping me right now. Um, but we do we do uh, calculate them using a couple of different values, and once they're out of that range, uh, we get droplet formation rather than a, a steady stream. So there is a limit to that. But the limit to the the shell thickness, I'm not too sure what that would be.
Uh, thank you. Uh, I've got many other questions, but I'm going to stop and let others <laughs> ask. Hey, here's one more. How do you connect your liquid metal wires to other components? Is Galistan corrosive to other metals? I think Adam froze. Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> okay, well, until Adam is back, because I that question would be for him. Does anyone else have a question for Carly at this time? Okay, Dr. Samioto can answer for Adam if he's unable to reconnect. Yeah, this is Dirk. I have a question for, for Carly, if I may. All right. Yeah, so that's a, a lot of work uh, and interesting work, uh, Carly. A lot of pigs, uh, but also a lot of work to do the histology. So, but my so my question would be so um, so, so you're trying to figure out where um, the difference in ISMS and epidural stim, which parts of the spinal cord are actually working. But so, how does this help you speed up making an ISMS array? or an ISMS implantable device that's ready for human implant? Like, why do we need this information to get to a human implant? Well, I think to, <clears throat> to fully understand what's happening um, and to, to, to then understand that, you know, this, this is one piece of a larger project that's going to look at this over the long term. So we're really looking at, <clears throat> we want to know, my, my project is kind of looking at, it, it's intact animals, so it's a normative uh, mm -hmm, data. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if we then do an injured animals, we can look at the changes, right, that happen with injury, and then you compare them. And it gives you a better idea of <clears throat> what, what actually happens with ISMS. Does that answer your question? Not really, because imagine if, I mean, if you would talk to the Humboldt player, does he really care uh, which part of the spinal cord works with ISMS, uh, as long as it's working. So mm -hmm. if, if I was a patient, I would want to have a, a device as soon as possible that can help me. And if you think that an ISMS implant is better than an epidural, then move forward. Uh, and, but I don't really care where which part of my spinal cord is working if I'm if I'm a patient. Uh, and then I had another question. So so if you want to, so a lot of my questions. So you're comparing, you're trying to match um, what you're doing with the epidural and ISMS, right? So are you? Or are you matching this at a functional level? Because you mentioned you're and you're stimulating for five hours, so you're you're stimulating to a level where you have a barely visible contraction. Also, you mentioned. So, mm -hmm. are, are these contraction levels similar? With are you trying to match that between ISMS and the epidural? And the next question would be, um, why is such a low level of contraction level? Because this would it and would it be more clinically relevant to like cycle, do a cyclic stimulation where you reach higher levels of functionality, let's say, to, to sort of match what you would be getting what, what, or what you need to produce function is my, my point. So it's, 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 it seems like you're stimulating with a sub-functional stimulation level, right? So why not use a functional stimulation level? But then I understand you can't do that five hours continuously, but then like cycle through a functional stimulation level, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So in terms of... Um... Uh, I guess the why study the changes that are occurring. We need to know that it's safe and we need to know what's happening. Um, it also hasn't been done in humans yet. And pigs are uh, much more similar to humans than say the cat. So that's why we can't just jump to it in humans. Um, there needs to be some, some studies done ahead of time. And we can't, you know, without this preliminary data, we can't just jump into people when we have another model that's similar, more similar to a human than other models that have been used such as cats and rats. Um, in terms of, sir, what was your second question? Well, would it be, would it, uh, if you're matching the stimulation levels uh, during your experiment? Yeah, so we are, we're between, matching them between, visually. Yeah. Right, um, right. We, we look, uh, and that, that's why we're using a just barely visible contraction is you can, you can see that visually and you can look at that between the two uh, stimulation types, right? We can, we play around with the stimulation settings until we're seeing that just barely visible contraction and we maintain it there throughout the experiment. Um, mm -hmm. And that's going with that level is just, this is still, um, this is new, it's the first step in this larger project. So mm -hmm. 
So why not use a visit? Why not use a functional stimulation level? Is my question. Um, I think because you can't then make the, because the the stimulation. Um, she would have a lot higher currents. You'd have a lot higher current. I think that you also need to. Um, we want we want to match the outcome between epidural stimulation and, and ISMS, and I think mm -hmm. that at clinical levels, those are those are not quite the same. So by being able to say like at this like threshold of stimulation, mm. this is what we see and then making the comparisons. And then maybe the next step is to look at maybe more clinically relevant stimulation parameters. But this is again, that, that first step. Okay. Or you, I guess you're saying with, with the epidural, maybe you're not actually getting such a, a big movements anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Is that so? You're so with the epidural, you have limited movements, and you're then matching the ISMS with the epidural. Is that what I'm hearing? Like, how much movement do you get with the epidural? I I don't know. Uh, in our experience, we're like we're just getting a very small contraction. You see a small amount of flexion and a very small amount of extension, like and we see that in both. Okay. Okay. All right, guys, we only have one minute left. So I'm going to take it back to Adam. It looks like he has joined us for that question. Adam, did you see the question from earlier? It is, how do you connect your liquid metal wires to other components? Is Galistan corrosive to other metals? If you're speaking, you're muted and we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes, it is corrosive to some metals, um, especially uh, brasses, uh, some bronzes, especially at higher temperatures, it will absolutely destroy aluminum. It, yeah, it'll just eat it away. Um, but something like platinum, iridium, uh, gold, it works quite nicely. Uh, it also works really well with steel. Um, and for now, basically what we've been doing is we've been using uh, male jumper cable pins and just sticking one of the, the pins in one of the ends. And that holds it together well enough. Um, we could always use a, a little drop of cyanoacrylate glue around the, the junction and maybe put a, um, a shrink fit connector on there just to give it a little bit extra strength. Or there's some other, some other ways you can do it. You could coat the entire thing in silicone just to give it an extra protective layer. Um, but there's a bunch of a bunch of options for connection. Okay, well, guys, it is one o'clock. So if there is nothing else, thank you very much for joining us today. And be sure to join us for the first, I guess, for the second Friday every month for Smart Talks. And everybody have a great day. Thanks, you too. Thanks, guys. <laughs>